Hello, I'm Mike Derby. I'm a reporter with the Wall Street Journal. I'm part of the uh, team we have covering the Federal Reserve, and so I'll be moderating this panel. And we will be talking about the uh, U.S. growth and un, uh, employment outlook. And it's obviously a fairly interesting time to hold this panel because we're at a point where the economy has been expanding for you know a fairly substantial amount of time, but there's a lot of discontent with the quality of the recovery where we stand with it. Um, a lot of that discontent is supposed to be seen in the outcome of the election. And so with that in mind, uh, you know, it's a fairly interesting time in terms of, uh, you know, unemployment has declined a lot from its peak, but right now a lot of you know, Fed officials in particular are struggling with, you know, is the sort of job market we have as good a job market we can have or can we get better? Is it possible to have a lower unemployment rate without causing the sort of um, inflation fears that they have problems with? And the inflation issue has also been interesting as well because, you know, we've had years of inflation undershooting the Fed's 2 percent target and it only seems now that we're starting to get up where the Fed would like it to be. Um, but, you know, it's still a very tentative thing. And so in that climate, you know, uh, the Federal Reserve is in a very interesting time and uh, we have had some interest rate increases. We're uh, finally seem to be in a position where there might be more interest, uh, more interest rate increases over the rest of the year. And uh, when we heard from Esther George speaking early this morning, we were t uh, talked about how the balance sheet might finally be reduced this year. And so there's a lot of moving pieces uh, with the economy right now. And then you know, the topic of the conference is America first. And obviously that comes from uh, President Trump. And you know he is a president that is, we, it's hard to know what he's going to do. And all of that, uh, you know, will he be a protectionist or a pragmatist? Uh, will he be effective or hapless? We don't know. But so I guess with that in mind, we'll go ahead and start. And we're going to start with uh, Instruction team. Thank you. Good morning, uh, everyone, and uh, thanks for having me back. Uh, means I didn't offend too much last time, I guess, uh, which is nice. Um, America first, uh, in perspective, uh, is what I'd like to talk about. Uh, King off the theme of uh, this year's conference. And of course, as mentioned, uh, that's how the Trump administra is administration plans uh, to make America great again. Now, um, that really means getting the US back to the economic dominance that it enjoyed several decades ago uh, toward the middle of the 20th century. And to put that economic dominance in perspective, uh, I'd like to, uh, I think it's instructive, uh, to take a very long view of history uh, and then zoom in a bit. So I'd like to look at three different time frames. Uh, first, and when I mean long view, I, I really mean long view, the uh, last two millennia, uh, and in particular, the last two centuries. Uh, second, uh, the 21st century, uh, including the next <coughs> several years to come. Uh, and then finally, the near-term cyclical uh, outlook for the next couple of quarters. Uh, so perspective, of course, is a funny thing. Uh, you may uh, recognize this cartoon uh, of a New Yorker's view of the world. Uh, it shows ninth out, I think this is yeah, 76, so it's a, some of you may not recognize it. Uh, it shows 9th and 10th Avenues in great detail in the foreground, then the Hudson River, uh, a thin strip that is New Jersey, uh, the rest of America and the Pacific Ocean all scrunched up uh, together, and barely visible on the far horizon, uh, you have Asia. Right? Okay, this quite reasonably describes uh, many uh, people's uh, subjective reality, um, but it's also a highly distorted view. It's wildly exaggerating the importance of the near at the expense of the far. 
And so it is with our sense of history. Because again, perspective is a funny thing. So I'd like to start off from Angus uh, Madison's life work. Uh, we have economic data going back over 2,000 years. And here's how that data is typically summarized. It's the, this is, uh, I just lifted the main chart on uh, Angus Madison's uh, Wikipedia page and posted it here. Uh, around the middle of the chart, excuse me, I just want to get my, okay. So around the middle of the chart, uh, you see the decline of China and India and the rise of, uh, let's see, Europe and then the US. And towards the end of the chart, uh, you see those trends reverse a little bit, and the end of the chart is at 2003. But uh, please notice that, like the New Yorker cartoon, it wildly overemphasizes the near at the expense of the far. Uh, a thousand years uh, on the left of the chart uh, occupies the same space as 30 years on the right. Now, uh, instead, having updated the Madison data through last year, uh, this next chart shifts the historical perspective to properly show the passage of time. Uh, what becomes clear is that for more than 90% of these two millennia, China and India together uh, dominated the world economy, accounting for about half or more of global GDP in terms of real purchasing power. In year one, all the way at the left, uh, India's share was nearly a third of global GDP, and China's was over a quarter, both bigger than the Roman Empire. Uh, Asia as a whole produced almost uh, three quarters. Asia's basically from the red now. Uh, almost uh, three quarters of all global output at that point. So a thousand years later, which is the middle of the, of the chart, uh, those percentages had only declined a little. Of course, the main point of this chart is that China and India dominated the world economy for the vast majority of this period until a couple of centuries ago. And then there were huge shifts with the rise of the West, which is shown in the blues. Uh, and the West dominated the global economy by the middle of the 20th century. But as it's clear to see, that historical moment was the exception in the long history of world GDP. So before I move on, uh, please take a second to appreciate uh, just how breathtakingly fast the rise of the West was and how equally swift the reversal of fortune has been. So now let's zoom in on the last two centuries of very rapid change. So of course, uh, we have in Europe's Industrial Revolution, which started in the late 1700s, not on the chart, and, and soon spread to the US. And that's part of what's going on in combination with Western colonial exploitation. That was really what was responsible for the plunge in India and China's share of world GDP between the early 18th and mid 20th century. So in a span of just 130 years, from 1820 to 1950, so 1820 is when the chart starts through 1950, um, the GDP share of Asia, excluding the Middle East, plummeted from almost 60% to only 16%. So it's starting up here and comes all the way down. It's quite the, quite the fall. By the end of World War II, the US reigned supreme. Command, so World War II end is right about here. Um, commanding over a third of world GDP. And taken together with Western Europe, that accounted for 57% of global 
So the mid 20th century saw the GDP share of the West at its zenith, with America dominating the West for decades thereafter. So today, when people say make America great again, they're really harking back to this period. For Asia, excluding the Middle East, the comeback started pretty slowly between 1950 and 1980. And the climb then accelerated with that share surging past 30% by the turn of the century, which is here, um, and standing at 43% today, which is a 160 year high. Meanwhile, the combined share of the US and Western Europe has fallen uh, to just a third, which is a 166 year low. And the US share um, is now half. So the US is just the blue here. It's half of what it used to be at the mid 20th century peak. So it's the pace of that decline that's really worthy of notice as we're thinking about today. The very far right side of the chart, here's 2000, and then you go on another 15 or so years. Um, that's when the pace of change has really speeded up. Just since the start of this century, Western Europe has lost nearly a third of its global GDP share, while the US has lost more than a fifth since the start of the century. This is similar to the fastest periods of decline for China and India back in the day. So it's this swift swing of the pendulum back from that mid 20th century extreme that really provides some important, I think necessary, historical perspective. And remember, the two key factors driving the rise of the West relative to others through the mid 20th century were the Industrial Revolution and colonialism. But then we've seen the twilight of colonialism followed in recent decades by a great deal of technological catch up uh, in China and in India, and that is not over. So, um, has the relative decline of the West and the rise of the rest really run its course? If not, it's going to be a very tall order for the US to get back to more than a third of world GDP, or even the 22% share average over the Reagan years. And so you see the decline, and then here's roughly the Reagan years. A little bit of a slowdown in the decline. And so even if, we, if that's the benchmark. Now, in, very, in, in, in recent years, the last few years, annual world GDP growth, excluding the US, has been running at 3.7% a, a year, while US GDP growth has been running at just over 2% a year. So it follows that in order for the US to gain back any GDP share, it needs to grow at almost twice its 2% rate on a sustained basis. So how likely is that? <laughs> now, the decline in America's dominance in the 21st century has been driven partly by the resurgence of China and India, but it's also the fact that US trend growth has really downshifted. And on that point, uh, it's instructive to revisit uh, the simple math behind potential GDP growth that I've discussed at previous uh, conferences. So in uh, 2008, and this is pre-Lehman, we first identified the long-term decline in trend growth in the US. And subsequently, we explained that decline by using the simple math captured in this chart, uh, which is in the simple math behind potential GDP growth, namely that it's the sum of productivity growth and potential labor force growth. And so this chart begins in the middle of the 20th century and shows potential labor force growth as the bottom blue line, which the CBO, so this bottom panel is potential labor force. The CBO projects uh, that will grow uh, at, will at the, projects the average under half a percent per year for the next six years, 
And I've marked that off by the horizontal red line <laughs> here. And that's pretty much set in stone given the demographics. Now productivity growth for the past six years has averaged half a percent a year. And uh, that's marked off by the horizontal red line on the right hand side uh, of the top panel. And that is obviously far below this post-World War II through 2008 uh, uh, average of two and a quarter percent. So we've been making the point uh, at ECRI for some time that productivity growth is unlikely to rise materially from the last six years average over the next several years. And it's not that productivity growth cannot rise at some point uh, in the future, merely that it's unlikely to do so anytime soon. So you have the CBO's potential labor force growth of half a percent and the latest six year average of half a percent of productivity growth, adding those up, uh, you get 1% longer term real GDP growth. And since potential labor force growth over the next several years is, as I said, set in stone, in order to achieve the, quote, sustained 3 to 4% GDP growth, unquote, promised by uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, we would need to see six times the last six years productivity growth. That's what the goal is. And uh, uh, to put that in perspective, because I know we sometimes hark back to the Reagan years as something to go for, that would be twice the productivity growth that we saw then. Okay, so then the other side of this coin is uh, immigration, and that's also a key element of the Trump policy agenda. And what that suggests is that even this potential labor force growth is not guaranteed. Undocumented workers aside, legal immigration accounts for the bulk of U.S. labor force growth. So of the half a percent per year potential labor force growth for the coming years, um, they, they, legal immigrants account for two-thirds. So if net immigration, for example, were to go to zero, potential labor force growth would be cut to less than 0.2% per year. And that's the lower purple horizontal line. Okay, so simple math, adding that to half a percent, you get 0.7% potential GDP growth. In other words, diminished legal immigration, let alone massive deportation of undocumented immigrants, could significantly reduce potential GDP growth for the coming years. So in 2009, 2009 uh, building on uh, this earlier work, we showed that the structural downshift in trend growth went well beyond the United States and was also taking place uh, in all the other major economies. And once again, this was because of the simple math of demographics and productivity growth. So bear with me on this chart. This is, last year I showed a 3D blanket of uh, all kinds of stuff. So this is my simplified version. I'm doing a much simpler chart. Using similar data, uh, this chart shows um, the so-called simple math for the G7 economies. The starting coordinate for each country's arrow is the average uh, in the 1957 to 2007 period for productivity growth uh, and labor force growth. So that's the starting point, 57 to 2007 average of productivity growth and labor force growth. The ending coordinates near the arrow heads are defined by the average productivity growth for the past five years and potential labor force growth for the next five years. The slanting gray lines, uh, what you might call ISO GDP growth lines, these slanting lines, capture that simple math adding up. Uh, in other words, the sum of the horizontal and vertical coordinates of every point on the 1% line, so here's the 1% line, okay? The sum of the horizontal and vertical coordinates of every point there add up to uh, 1%. So I can't exactly see it, but let's, I can see it over here. Like five and five 
0 0.5 and 0 0.5. 0 0.5 labor force growth, 0 0.5 productivity growth places us right on the 1% potential GDP line. Similar for the 0% line, which uh, actually comes into play here. As you can see, everybody, all these countries, are headed in the wrong direction, converging toward 0 to 1% trend GDP. So those are where things are headed. Uh, the red X that's floating right here uh, in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the chart, uh, marks off Japan's lost decades from 1992, when its post uh, bubble recession started, uh, to the eve of the financial crisis. All the major economies are heading for even worse predicaments. Uh, Germany's demographic problem: uh, the next five years' potential labor force growth. Uh, right here, um, is slightly worse than even uh, Japan's. Uh, and that may in part explain uh, Chancellor Merkel's generosity uh, in 2015 toward refugees, which promises to change these demographics a little bit. So what I've described here are the structural bounds that will define the growth potential of the advanced economies for the next several years. The underlying patterns in economic growth that do not change from year to year. <coughs> now, um, turning to cyclical issues that do change in the shorter term, uh, things look quite different. In fact, um, they are the most positive that they've been in years. Now, as you, as, as you may know, uh, ECRI's co-founder, the late Jeffrey H. Moore, created the first leading indexes of recession and recovery uh, half a century ago, uh, which is why the Wall Street Journal <laughs> uh, called him the father of leading indicators. Uh, since then, we've developed leading indexes for many other countries, including long leading indexes that look a bit further ahead than typical leading indicators like stock prices or PMIs. And this chart here shows the smooth growth rate of ECRI's long leading index for the G7 countries combined. And that's the top green line, uh, which leads G7 uh, coincident index growth, uh, shown by the bottom blue line. Now, the G7 LLI growth is practically back up to uh, this three-year high. Um, and in turn, the G7 coincident index uh, growth has also turned up. And a couple of things. By the way, we, we, this is a G7 indicator. Uh, we have a 20-country long leading index, which includes uh, all the major uh, emerging markets. And it's also uh, swinging up and is, in fact, around its best reading since the global financial crisis. Uh, one other point I'd like to note is that the election is right around here. So these cyclical uh, shifts were uh, underway before the election. Um, as were, and now this is for growth, and now I'm switching to inflation. Uh, since the early 80s, following the experience of U.S. stagflation, uh, we've monitored leading indicators of inflation uh, that are separate from our leading indicators of economic growth, and we call them future inflation gauges, and they measure underlying inflation pressures that anticipate cyclical turns in actual inflation. And they also typically have a, a short lead over uh, inflation expectations. Now, ECRI's G7 future inflation gauge is at its highest reading since the middle of 2008, and that's shown by the top red line. And following uh, uh, its upturn, the G7 CPI inflation has clearly begun its own uh, rise, a cyclical upturn, and is at its highest reading in almost three years. And that's the bottom black line. So one other thing, again, you can see that the future inflation gauge turned up well before 
all the uh, global uh, reflation talk that began last year. So this began moving up uh, at the beginning of, 26, of 2016. Now, um, in closing, I want to show a little bit about the U.S. Uh, here we have growth in the U.S. long leading index uh, that has been in an uptrend since last year uh, and remains near a multi-year high. So here's uh, the beginning of 2016. It's been running up. There's a bit of a downtick here in the most recent reading that we're keeping an eye on. Um, the upturn in actual U.S. growth began around the middle of 2016. We have year-over-year uh, -year growth in uh, GDP uh, at a one-year high. We'll probably edge up from there in the, in the next reading. Uh, industrial production growth is near a 20-month high. And um, as mentioned earlier, the jobless rate is at its best reading in almost a decade. But there are concerns about the hard data uh, not being uh, strong enough, and indeed, uh, something is undermining real growth. Here you have the U.S. future inflation gauge, uh, which turned up over a year ago and remains elevated. Uh, and actual inflation, as discussed earlier, has uh, since turned up as well. Now, you can see the, the, U, the future inflation gauge turned up well before uh, inflation expectations, which had actually plunged in the middle of uh, 2016. Uh, but what is unusual about this cycle, it's atypical, uh, is that the inflation upturn began before uh, the cyclical upturn in growth. So real GDP and real income growth are being undercut more than usual by rising inflation. Uh, so this is part of the reason that in real, uh, meaning inflation adjusted terms, the so-called hard data looks relatively weak. Nevertheless, both the US and the global economies are in simultaneous cyclical upturns in economic growth and inflation, and those cycle upturns are set to continue for now. So from a near-term cyclical point of view, our analysis of the outlook is unambiguously positive, period. Um, but, <laughs> there's always the but, when we expand our view to consider the next several years, because of those structural factors, potential GDP growth is seriously constrained and likely converging to around 1% a year for the U.S. And the really long view over centuries and millennia makes it painfully clear how extraordinary it was for the U.S. to achieve the economic dominance that it enjoyed uh, several decades ago. So I would say let's enjoy our uh, cyclical good fortune while it lasts and have the vision to recognize uh, the longer term reality of the global economy. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, next we'll hear from Michael Faroli uh, with J.P. Morgan. Uh, there we go. All right, so uh, my name is Mike Faroli. I'm Chief U.S. Economist at J.P. Morgan. Uh, naturally, a couple of my comments are going to overlap with what Lachman said, um, but I think maybe one of the differences is I'll probably focus a little more near term on the cyclical things going on in the U.S. Uh, so first, just looking back before looking forward, uh, 2016, 2% uh, growth. Uh, this expansion, we've averaged 2.1% growth. We think first half we're looking at 2% growth. So that sounds all pretty bland. Um, and it kind of has been, though, even with 2% growth, uh, the unemployment rate declined last year. Uh, this year, we started off kind of with, once again, some renewed enthusiasm that this time is going to be different. Certainly, the sentiment measures uh, have been quite strong. Uh, risk assets are well bid. Uh, and the global situation certainly looks a little less foreboding than it did uh, 
at this time last year. Even with all that, uh, we are tracking Q1 GDP growth. We officially have it penciled in at 1%, but it's probably looking more like 0.6, 0.7 right now. Um, that being said, we are looking for 3% growth uh, in Q2, uh, which would leave first half uh, around 2%. Uh, we already have some indications that consumption growth, which was exceptionally weak in January and February, looks like it's firming up in March. Um, for the year, uh, not surprisingly, we have 2% growth. Uh, our estimate of trend or supply side uh, potential GDP growth is 1.4%. Uh, just to put that in context, uh, the median uh, among FOMC participants has recently come down to 1.8%. Uh, blue chip uh, basically consensus around Wall Street is around a little over 2%. Uh, so we thought we were on the pessimistic side of things with a 1.4% estimate. But I guess given the first presentation, uh, we kind of come off maybe a little more optimistic than I usually, uh, um, the, the company I'm usually in. Uh, regardless, if you're at 1% or 1.4%, that means if you have GDP growth at 2%, the unemployment rate should be coming lower over the course of the year, which we think uh, validates the Fed's current expectations that they're going to hike again uh, in June and September, and that probably in December they start to this slow process of unwinding this four and a half trillion dollar uh, balance sheet. Uh, so just to put that in pictures, uh, on the left hand side is GDP <coughs> growth butterfly charts, which basically plot GDP uh, across several recent expansions. And you can see at this expansion, not only do you have a big recession, but you've had uh, remarkably slow, but also remarkably steady GDP growth. Uh, in spite of that, and what's been really, I think, surprising if you told people gave people this chart on the left-hand side seven or eight years ago, they wouldn't have expected the chart on the right-hand side, which is that unemployment rate has come down uh, to levels that are now within uh, shelling distance of most people's estimates of what the natural rate is. Um, <clears throat> so let me just start by kind of breaking down our outlook for aggregate demand before getting into aggregate supply and the inflation and, and Fed outlook. So. Uh, Let's start with consumption. Uh, on the left-hand side is an aggregate of various consumption uh, or consumer sentiment indicators. Uh, they had been trending higher. It does appear to have spiked around the election, whether that is an election phenomena or just the fact that we were getting back to full employment right around that time. I think it's hard to disentangle. Um, but regardless, uh, we've seen pretty steady you know, continuation of those trends. Um, on the right-hand side, just one metric of the health of the household balance sheets. Uh, this is household debt. Uh, debt to income is uh, the top line, and then debt to overall GDP is the bottom line. We don't know what the steady state value for that is, but it certainly looks uh, better than it did uh, several years ago. So I think there's some reason to uh, believe that the deleveraging process has stopped. We started to see households uh, start to uh, gradually take on a little more debt. Staying on the topic of the balance sheet, uh, on the left-hand side, the blue line is household net worth uh, as a percent of income. And you can see that right now, obviously, because of the uh, growth in both stock prices and house prices, you've had this nice move back up in the uh, net worth to income ratio. Uh, that orange line is the saving rate inverted. So generally, people think that higher net worth leads people to lower their saving rate. However, in this expansion, for some reason, these wealth effects haven't played out like they did in the last two, if you want to call them asset price bubbles, of the dot-com boom and the housing boom. Uh, and consumers have treated this wealth or this windfall uh, in their wealth over the past few years a little more cautiously as they've kept saving rates around 5, 5.5%. Five uh, one reason for that is that up until quite recently, consumers this rise in wealth was not, as it has been in the past, being matched with a rise in expectations for, for labor income, which is on the right-hand side. And that's taken from that monthly University of Michigan sentiment, uh, su survey of consumer sentiment. And so we are a little encouraged that recently it does look like households are actually starting to expect uh, some income gains. So perhaps we're starting to see some of the fruits of this tightening in the labor market in terms of uh, household behavior. So overall, we are expecting um, uh, households 
to start spending again in the, in the second quarter, uh, in part because of the strength of the labor market. Now, we did have a disappointing March uh, payroll <coughs> report, which was only 98,000 jobs created last month. Uh, we think that was a weather aberration. The timely data on jobless claims uh, actually kind of speak, uh, spiked around the time when that jobless uh, the jobs number was taken for March. So we do think that the improvement we've seen recently suggests uh, the labor market still looks pretty healthy. Um, one wild card, I think, for the consumption outlook longer term is what's going to happen with tax policy. Um, we are not penciling in a whole lot of boosts uh, here for two reasons. One, we think the political path to tax cuts may be a little bit challenging. Certainly our D.C. office seems to think that. And secondly, uh, it does seem like, at least if the president had his priorities uh, fulfilled, that most of the tax cuts would go to, uh, as you can see in that bottom chart, uh, about half of the dollar value of the tax cuts under the president's plan would go to the top 1%, who are generally viewed as having probably a lower marginal propensity to consume this windfall and probably would also likely view it as temporary, given kind of the, the political ping pong that's been played with uh, upper income tax rates. So we're not really uh, expecting that to boost uh, consumer spending all that much. Uh, but overall, you know, we think the consumption uh, picture looks pretty good for, again, at least the next few quarters. Uh, turning to housing, uh, construction, as you can see on the left-hand side, is still well below uh, pre-crisis levels. Of course, pre-crisis levels were associated with rising inventories of unsold homes, so that's not necessarily the benchmark we want to go for. Uh, even so, we think um, gains in housing starts are probably going to be uh, only moderate from here going forward, uh, in part because we are seeing uh, less household formation. As you can see on the right-hand side, this is the living situation of, I guess, these would be called millennials, 25 to 34-year-olds, uh, and consistent with all the stories you hear, uh, as you can see with that orange line, uh, the share of uh, people in that uh, age group living in their parents' households continues to move higher. Uh, I think, you know, two, three, four years ago, people thought, well, this will, you know, reverse itself as the labor market improves. But over those two, three, or four years, we've seen the jobless rate go nothing but down, including for this subgroup uh, of the labor market. So there does seem to be something perhaps more cultural going on there than just a bad economy keeping down household formation. Um, let me just say a word about capital spending. It's been pretty disappointing in both 2015 and 2016. Uh, we think a big part of that was related to the downturn in energy prices. Uh, capital spending, at least in me as measured in the U.S., is reported by product rather than by industry. But the products that tend to be most closely associated with the oil and gas industry uh, accounted for much of the downturn in, uh, in capital spending over the past few years. Uh, we do have a decent chunk of first quarter data on capital spending in, and it looks like we're probably poised for a rebound to mid-single digits growth in overall capital spending. So uh, we think a lot of the damage there has, uh, is behind us and, and arguably getting a little better, at least in the near term. Um, in part, we've also seen uh, profits, which you can see on the left-hand side, uh, are coming back in part because a lot of that is being driven by the, um, uh, by the energy sector as well. And sentiment indicators, of course, on the right-hand side uh, have improved for both manufacturing and the non-manufacturing sector. Uh, manufacturing has been doing great over the last three to six months globally. It's been doing great here in the U.S. So there, the surge in the sentiment seems more consistent with what we're seeing in the hard data. It seems more consistent with the global story, we think, than with, a, uh, with an election story. So that, I don't think there's too much of a mystery as to what's going on there. I'm gonna skip this chart, it's a little out of the way. Uh, I guess I should say, even though this is focused on the US, a few words about the global uh, picture. Um, it, we are feeling a little less, as a US economy, <laughs> economist challenged, by the global outlook. Uh, one reason is, as you can see on the left-hand side, since the beginning of the year, uh, the broad trade-weighted dollar has actually declined by about 4%. So some of that run-up that we saw uh, both after the election as well as over the prior two and a half years 
we think some of those effects are starting to fade, and we are seeing better growth, as you can see, on the right-hand side in both imports and exports. Um, and generally speaking, uh, we're feeling better about uh, the external picture. Uh, we got Chinese GDP data over the weekend, which was good. Uh, Brazilian data came in yesterday, which was actually looking better. Um, and I guess I should say that you know, you see on the, the upper right-hand side that uh, share of our exports that goes to all others, 75%. Um, about a third of our exports go to uh, China and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, to Mexico and Canada. Uh, Canadian data has looked great over the past uh, few quarters, and Mexico, the outlook is starting to pick up uh, as well, at least over the past uh, month or two. So overall, we're feeling um, one of the rare times in the past few years where uh, the outlook domestically is not facing a big challenge from uh, what we're seeing uh, overseas. Obviously, we could create our own problems in terms of trade policy. Um, that has been, I think, for every economist, we've put that in the tail risk category of something that could go wrong, uh, particularly if we were to have kind of large scale um, uh, across the board tariffs. Um, for what it's worth, uh, as you can see here, industries that tend to export also tend to import a lot. And so we don't think you're going to see among uh, domestic constituents arguing for a more aggressive trade posture, export intensive industries. So um, hopefully we can dodge this, uh, dodge this risk, but it does remain something that uh, we are while generally pretty sanguine about the next year or two, this remains something that, um, you know, we worry about a little. So now let me turn to uh, uh, the supply side of the economy, and some of this is going to uh, echo the previous um, presentation. Uh, on the left-hand side, and again, this comes back to the, the arithmetic that was described there. You add this and you add that, you pretty much get trend growth. The last five years, we've been averaging uh, non-farm business productivity growth of 0.7%, um, and we expect, uh, along the <coughs> census, that resident working age population of around a half percent or so, again, with a little more than half of that coming from the foreign-born uh, segment. So, um, so the picture there does not look uh, good in terms of trend growth, and this does get you to around 1%. We are projecting a little bit of a pickup in productivity growth, but not with a whole lot of conviction because we don't see a whole lot of reasons in the near term why uh, productivity growth should pick up. Now, why has productivity growth been weak? There's a lot of theories out there. We tend to align with one of those theories, which is most popularly associated with Robert Gordon, which is basically a slowdown in tech advancement. Um, so first, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, this is capital equipment. Uh, as a share of GDP divided into both tech and non-tech. Uh, as you can see, that gold line, which is non-tech or orange, whatever it is, uh, has come down recently. Again, most of that is because of the energy sector. But generally speaking, what you see there is that the levels of non-tech investment as a share of GDP don't look particularly weak compared to the standards of the past few cycles. What does look weak is spending on IT equipment, which has just continue to kind of grind lower. Uh, so we don't think, you know, an animal spirit story explains this well because it would be kind of odd that animal spirits would hold back <coughs> one form of investment rather than another. Rather, we think that the user cost of tech equipment is not declining as fast <coughs> as it did in the past. And on the left-hand side is a computer, one type of, of tech equipment, but a, an important type, uh, which is computers. And these are uh, constant quality or hedonically adjusted prices relative to overall uh, GDP prices uh, on a two-year average basis. And you can see in the late 90s, uh, real quality adjusted computer prices were declining over 25% uh, per year, whereas more recently, uh, those are declining uh, mid-single digits. So uh, if the market for computers is competitive, this should equate to a slower uh, degree of advancement in the frontier of, uh, of, the uh, of technology embodied in that equipment. And so we do think this is uh, consistent with 
uh, a Gordon type story that suggests uh, uh, technology that at least as usable for producing physics output may not be advancing as fast. Uh, and we think two other facts are somewhat consistent with that, which is one that was already mentioned uh, previously on the right-hand side is on, uh, if you look at the G10 over you know, long horizons, you've seen slowdowns in, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, productivity growth everywhere. Uh, and also, if you look across, and this is for the U.S. on the left-hand side, um, <coughs> similar long horizons, you've seen uh, productivity slow down in almost every industry except for uh, mining, which is dominated by oil and gas. That's only 1.5% uh, of GD, uh, around 1.5% of value added in the, in the uh, nation. So almost every industry you've seen slowdowns in uh, uh, productivity as well, which you know would be consistent with a slowing in a general purpose technology that affects a lot of these industries, and we think um, uh, tech kind of fits that bill. So case isn't <laughs> dispositive, but we think it's pretty convincing that this is a likely reason for why we've been having uh, poor productivity um, experiences uh, over the past 10 years. And also I would add to that that uh, I think most statistical break tests for when productivity slowed would point to uh, some point prior to the recession, so 2004, 2005, which again I think is a little bit at odds with a story that speaks to a recession hangover story, but I think it is more consistent with a Gordon type uh, tech story. Um, uh, just following up on the earlier remark uh, on immigration reform, that obviously is a downside risk to, um, to overall potential growth. It also could be quite disruptive uh, at a micro level for certain industries. As you can see on the right, at least according to the uh, uh, Pew Research Center, which uh, most people I think regard as being uh, having the best uh, unauthorized immigrants, um, you're seeing you know, in places like construction about an eighth of workers may be uh, undocumented. Um, so that uh, uh, I think there are some disruptive effects you could also have as well. So let me just turn back, uh, shifting from uh, the supply side story to the labor market, and then I'll try and wrap up. Uh, probably already gone over time. Um, uh, unemployment recently at 4.5%. You know, our guess which is, I think, what it should be called, rather than an estimate of the neutral, uh, natural rate is around 5%. Uh, most people don't have a um, natural rate estimate for the mu 6, the broad uh, measure of underutilization. Um, but even that has improved to levels that historically are consistent uh, with full employment. Um, so the U6 includes discouraged workers, uh, marginally attached to labor force, and part-time. Right now, we think most of that is solely due to part-time for economic reasons. So, which may be a little odd because the labor force participation rate has come down so much that one would think that discouraged workers uh, are, you know, an exceptionally large po uh, share of the population, but it just doesn't seem to be the, the case. And on the participation rate, uh, participation rate is measured as everyone 16 and over who is looking for a job or has a job. Um, it doesn't, there's no cutoff point. Uh, and so the population that is over 65%, uh, which is generally gonna have a lower participation rate, we think is holding down the average. And <clears throat> actually, as we look at uh, prime age, which is 25 to 54, um, for both men and women, uh, recent developments seem to be along the lines of trends fitted to the decade prior to the and overall, as you look on the right-hand side, when we take trends that prevailed prior to the recession and extend them with the weights of the changing shares of the population, uh, the participation rate that currently prevails looks consistent with that. And we're not the only ones to do this type of exercise on the right-hand side, but I think generally uh, they all show a similar picture. Um, we don't find a whole lot of uh, responsiveness to changes uh, or to the level of unemployment. So we do think, you know, there is a relationship there. Uh, so there may be some benefits from the high pressure labor market. Uh, we just don't expect them to be uh, massive. Um, one thing we were a little surprised by um, in terms of the number of people working part time for economic reasons is uh, that there may be something to this story that the 30 hour a week cutoff could explain part of the increase. Um, and part of the reason is that 
uh, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, there does seem to be an increase in the number um, who are kind of just under the threshold of that 30 hour um, uh, uh, cutoff. So we, we estimate maybe about a quarter of that may be due to employers pushing employees into uh, part-time schedules. Um, regardless, we do think that the evidence is consistent with a tightening labor market. Uh, on the left-hand side is several measures of wage growth, uh, which can be all over the map. I think if you take a first principle component of these, what you get is that wages, which had been averaging around 2% uh, two an hour, averaging closer to 2.5, to 2.5 um, to 2 and 3 quarters. So we do think there is evidence that uh, um, we're starting to see some of the fruits of, uh, of a tighter labor market. And we think with productivity growth, the trend there may be being 1%-ish, that uh, you know, the, the right bogey for nominal wage growth consistent with price stability is going to be closer to 3% rather than you know, the 4% that I think most of us grew up kind of expecting to be normal. Um, and turning to the inflation story, uh, core inflation has firmed, at least it had until Friday. <laughs> Um, we got a really big surprise on Friday when no one, well, very few people were in the office. Some of us had to come in. Uh, but um, so that does give us a little bit of breathing room, I think, on the inflation picture, which had been firming. Uh, and our estimate based <coughs> on that, uh, that inflation print is that the core PCE deflator, which in February uh, was 1.75% on a year ago basis, in March probably eases back down to 1.60%. So. We do think that gives um, the Fed a little bit of uh, a little bit of breathing room, um, and you can well. I don't want to get too much into that print, but it's been uh, <laughs> hotly debated on um, uh, in certain parts of, of Manhattan. Um, so turning from inflation naturally to the Fed, and then wrapping up, uh, our view is that the Fed hikes in September. I'm sorry, in June and September. Um, and then that they try to start the balance sheet if the economy lets them in December. Uh, it does seem like there is a push here to kind of get the process started uh, while Yellen is still Fed chair. As most of you probably know, Yellen's term expires in uh, February of next year. Fisher's, uh, Stan Fisher's term expires in June. Uh, Tarullo uh, already left. Uh, so even um, with Quarles' uh, potential nomination, you're going to have uh, potentially another four vacancies. So that adds a lot of uncertainty here. But we do think there is a fair degree of certainty for, um, for this year. Again, if the economy behaves uh, and they can start this normalization process for the balance sheet in December, um, have it in place so that it's going to be, I think, hard to amend that once the process is agreed on by the committee as a whole. Um, and then, uh, you know, as a Fed behind the curve, they keep asking them that, they keep publicly asking themselves this, so it clearly is on their mind. Um, and I think it's an interesting question, as you can see from this Dornbush quote, uh, none of the post-war expansions died of old age, they were all murdered by the Fed. Usually they were murdered not because the Fed's malicious, but because the Fed uh, gets behind the curve and has to get ahead of the curve, and in doing that usually sends the economy uh, into a downturn. Uh, so the argument there is, well, we're at full employment, wage growth is picking up. Well, core inflation is close to target. Well, we're getting a little bit of uh, some breathing room here uh, from last Friday's number, which again, is going to stay in the year ago prints up until next year. Um, the Taylor rules, to the extent one believes those, show the Fed's behind the curve. Um, but you know, as I say, you do get some breathing room, not only from the recent inflation print, but from the inflation expectations. Um, uh, now, if we did get fiscal policy uh, uh, that was deficit finance, we think that would increase these inflation risks and put the Fed behind the curve. So that doesn't seem like it's something that we would uh, advocate, at least fiscal policy that simply uh, is meant to, or simply results in an augmentation of aggregate demand. Um, so with that, I guess I will skip some of these other charts and uh, just wrap it up there. Thank you.
And uh, next we'll hear from Nicholas Nikoforos with uh, the Levy Institute. So, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Michalis Nikiforos. I'm a research scholar here at the Libby Institute. And uh, I want to present today a recent uh, policy report, a report that was published uh, last year on the state and the prospects of the U.S. economy. Uh, the report is co-authored with my colleague Gennaro Zeza, who is uh, in Italy and uh, he could not be here today. Um, let me just say before I, I begin that uh, you know the character of, of this report is uh, has a more uh, is is more of a medium term uh, analysis, and that's why this series of uh, of policy papers are called the strategic analysis. Uh, so it's neither a, a short term forecast or a super very long term uh, forecast as well. So let me let me start this way. Michael showed a um, a similar graph. These are the post war post-war recoveries of, uh, of the U.S. economy. Uh, the difference here is that this graph is from uh, trough to peak in, uh, in every recovery. The last three recoveries are with colors. The red one is the, the current recovery, and the gray lines uh, show the, all the previous post-war recoveries. So it's striking how the last three recoveries of the U.S. economy are on the lower side of uh, um, every previous uh, post-war recovery. And the current recovery is the, the slowest recovery uh, among all post-war recoveries in, um, in the United States. So from that point of view, and if we see, if we observe the, the red line, uh, 2016 was uh, another, let's say, normal year in, in the post-crisis uh, post period in the, in the United States. We had a very slow growth, but along this trend that has uh, dominated uh, since uh, 2009. Uh, and this is the, the recovery of the employment to population ratio. Uh, we can see here again that the current recovery has been uh, by far the slowest in the post-war period, and it was only uh, in two, during 2016 that the employment to population ratio uh, reached its, uh, its level uh, of uh, 2009. So it took uh, more than seven years for the empo employment population ratio to, to return to its um, uh, 2009 uh, level. 2016 was also kind of a normal year in the post-crisis period in the sense that all the conventional forecasts we're forecasting that a pickup in growth. So every year since 2009, the conventional forecasts are saying, well, this is going to be the year that the growth rate in the U.S. Uh, will pick up. And it was not also normal in the sense that this didn't happen. So the U.S. economy continued to grow, but at a very uh, modest rate. Uh, on our behalf, we have been more, uh, more cautious uh, in our forecast, and in, in several of, uh, of our previous reports, uh, we have identified three main structural problems uh, to, for, of the U.S. economy, which are impediments to a robust and sustainable recovery. And these three major problems are the high income inequality in the United States, the weak demand for net exports, and the fiscal uh, conservatism that has prevailed in the U.S. over the last uh, decades. And why is that if an economy faces weak net export demand and at the same time there is restrictive fiscal policy, then economic growth becomes dependent on rising private borrowing. And then growth can be the result only of a rise in private expenditure relative to income, and thus an increase in the debt-to-income ratio of the private sector, especially the household sector, and because of rising inequality, this increase in the debt-to-income ratio falls une unevenly on households at the bottom of the distribution. And because the growth process is so much dependent on increasing indebtedness of the private sector, then it also becomes dependent 
on asset inflation. So the main street is at the mercy of uh, the Wall Street to an unusual extent. So this process describes the path of the U.S. economy towards the crisis. So before the crisis, the U.S. economy managed to grow because the private sector, the especially the household sector, was accumulating more and more and more debt. But these structural problems also explain why the recovery has been so slow. Because of the fragile uh, condition of the balance sheet of the household sector, the, household sec the households have tried to deleverage and they, they have not been willing to increase their uh, indebtedness since the crisis. And that's why we, uh, we've uh, been a, uh, on this very slow growth path since 2009. So just to, to, to make these points a little bit uh, more clear, this is the same graph for uh, personal con for consumption in, in, uh, in the U.S. recovery. Not surprisingly, since consumption is uh, the biggest share of GDP, we can observe uh, the, same, the same path. And this is, this is where inequality plays a major role because it, income in a, increasing inequality means that a redistribution of income from households with a low propensity to consume with from households with high propensity to consume to households with low propensity to consume. So ceteris paribus, this, uh, uh, this leads to uh, lower growth in consumption and lower growth uh, in GDP. Now, the usual, <coughs> uh, the usual argument against this is that, well, we shouldn't talk about inequality because at the end of the day, uh, investment will pick up, growth will be created, and everybody, you know, the profits are going to trickle down and everybody will be better off. However, if we look at investment in this graph, we see that, again, the performance of investment during the current recovery has been disappointing. Actually, investment has stagnated for the last three years. Real investment has not increased at all in the last three years. And, in fact, 2016 was the first year in this recovery that the growth rate of investment was negative. Over the last three decades, the only years with negative growth rate in investment were 1990 and 1991, 2001 and 2002, and the years 2007, 2008, and 2009. All clustered, you know, around downturns in uh, in, uh, in the United States. Uh, this, is, this graph very clearly shows how fiscal conservatism uh, has been a major drag on growth in the United States. The red line shows that the current recovery has been the only, the only recovery in the post-war history of the United States that the real gov government expenditure has been, the real growth, uh, the growth in real government expenditure has been negative. So the growth rate, the real government expenditure now is lower compared where it was uh, seven years ago. And finally, to, to go to, the, to exports and imports, again, we see here how exports have been another major drag on, on the U.S. growth. Again, we see here that is this? Yes. So exports, real exports essentially have been flat since early 2014, for the last uh, almost three years. Now, the trade deficit has not increased that much because uh, imports have not grown uh, uh, as well. And the reason for that, the major reason for that is the, this new uh, extraction method uh, related with fracking, that they have reduced a lot imports of petroleum uh, and uh, related products of the U.S. economy, and obviously it also it's also related to the slow uh, the slow growth uh, in the United States economy. So, what is what is our baseline scenario? Our usual practice in in these reports is to build our baseline scenario around the forecast of uh, of the CBO's budget and economic outlook, which is published in January of every year. So. Uh, the reason for that is simple because CBO 
provides a forecast for a macroeconomic forecast and also a fiscal forecast. So the idea is that we build a baseline scenario that examines what are the conditions necessary for the CBO projections to materialize. Um, and the CBO projections this year, you can see them in this table. It, uh, the CBO is projecting a very modest decrease in government deficit uh, in the next couple of years, and then a modest, a modest decrease in the deficit, and then a modest increase back to 3.2% in 2020. And here, with regard to the growth rate, a very small increase in the growth rate to 2.3% in 2017 to 2% 2 in 2018. And then the growth rate converges to 1.6% more or less, which is what the CBO is uh, um, calculates as the new, let's say, natural growth rate. This is where the U.S. economy converges um, to. So the, the last two years are determined from, uh, from the supply side. The CBO projections this year are, are interesting for the reason that they are very, that compared to the previous uh, publications of the CBO are very pessimistic. So as I said, in all the previous years, we were very cautious when we uh, were discussing the CBO projections uh, for the simple reason that for the CBO projections to materialize in the previous year, you needed a very large increase in the indebtedness of the private sector, of the household sector, to support this kind of growth rate. And here are the CBO projections, for example, the, in the last four years, you see how the CBO was projecting in 2014 that the growth rate would be between three and three and a half percent. There, there is a slight decline. What we see here is that this year's projections are basically around the post-crisis average of the U.S. economy. And this is something that we also see with our model, like when we try to simulate the CBO projections and when we try to see, well, what are the necessary conditions for these projections to, to materialize, we see basically that we have a continuation of, of this post-crisis trend. This, these are the, the financial balances of the three sector of the U.S. economy. This is the, B, the trajectory of government deficit that is projected, projected by the CBO. And here we see that the private sector slowly, the financial balance of the private sector slowly decreases along its post-2013 trend, and the current account deficit also slowly decreases and reaches 4% by 2020. But there is nothing, the CBO projections are basically some kind of a business as usual projection. Business as usual at least uh, in, in the post-crisis period. This is another graph which shows what's gonna happen to the household and the uh, corporate debt to GDP ratio. We see that the household sector, again, the debt to GDP ratio of the household sector is, is flat. The non-financial corporations continue to accumulate debt. The only difference is that our econometrics show that, uh, and I think it's uh, pretty much everybody agrees with that, that the corporate debt does not really support uh, aggregate demand. It uh, has been kind of decoupled from investment while the household debt is very much uh, linked to, to consumption and, then, and, and that's growth. So this has been the situation of, over the last uh, seven, eight years and uh, these are our baseline projections. Uh, the new president promised before the election and has kept uh, promising after the elections that he will change that, he will make the you know, the American economy great again, and he, he will uh, implement economic policy that will lead to a pickup in growth. And if we want to summarize the most important of the economic proposals of the new administration, they include the repeal and replacement of the Affordable Care Act. This is already uh, not happening. An investment of one trillion 
uh, over 10 years in public infra infrastructure projects, tax cuts for corporations and households, reduction of the government deficit, and aggressive renegotiation of trade agreements and a reform of taxation policy to reduce the trade deficit. Now, even a casual look at this list shows some very fundamental, fundamental contradictions. So it's really hard to see how uh, the government deficit, deficit will be reduced and at the same time you will have an investment of $1 trillion and tax cuts. Obviously, this can happen if you have a massive reversal in, in the current account, but this is, this anyway, not very likely. Anyway, the financial markets have totally bought it. They have reacted uh, very nicely. We had a very nice run in the, in the stock market after uh, November. However, again, we are a little bit more cautious, and we think that the, the proper question to ask here is to what extent is this optimism warranted, and to what extent the policy, the policy proposals and the policy measures of the new administration can solve the three fundamental structural problems of the U.S. economy that uh, I talked about before, that we have identified. So we can start, you know, uh, very briefly talk about these three issues. So what about fiscal conservatism? Will, will the new administration be less fiscally conservative than the, the previous administrations? Uh, it's, it's hard to see how this is going to happen. So, for example, the new director of the, of, of the budget office of, uh, of the White House is, is one of the most fiscally conservative politicians in Washington right now. And the first budget proposal of the, uh, the new administration that was published a few weeks ago does not foresee any fiscal expansion. And also, the recent negotiations in Congress about the new health care bill show that the fiscally conservative wing of the Republican Party has gained unprecedented leverage. So it's hard to see how the new administration will be less, fi less fiscally conservative. And actually, the new budget proposal is a good example. There is an increase in the budget. There is an increase in the expenses for, def for defense. And then to compensate for this increase in expenses for defense, there is an across the board the board decrease in spending for um, uh, many other things. But in a way, the, the fiscal philosophy of the new, uh, of the new administration reminds this uh, Gantz versus uh, Butter model that people would study in, the, in their undergraduate courses of economics. So, they increase the budget for guns and they increase, decrease the budget for, uh, for everything else. Now, this zero-sum character of, of fiscal decisions will obviously have ne negative impact on income inequality as well, which is the first of the problems that I, I talked about before. Uh, we, we already see that in the new budget proposals, the increase in, uh, in the defense spending is compensated by cuts in a series of programs that uh, benefit uh, middle and uh, lower income households. And income inequality will also be affected if the contemplated tax reform is, uh, is successfully negotiated. So for the moment, it seems that there are two Republican plans for tax, report, uh, tax reform. The first is the, the plan uh, of uh, Paul Ryan. Uh, according to some studies, if this, plan goes, if this plan goes through 90, 90.6% of the tax cuts will benefit the wealthiest 1% uh, of the population in the US. There is a plan that is, uh, <clears throat> has been proposed by, by the new president. According to, this, uh, to the Trump plan, it's, it will only be 50% of the tax cut that will benefit uh, the wealthiest 1%, only 50%. Actually, the other 50% will also go to the top decile of income distribution, and only a, a very small fraction will go to, to the, uh, the middle class. So also based on the first evidence of, of the new administration, income inequality is not going to improve. 
if anything, there is going to be a further uh, deterioration in, uh, in inequality in the United States. Related to these two, there is you know, one of the uh, key proposals of, uh, of, Trump, of Mr. Trump before the elections has been the, this one trillion infrastructure investment over, over a time horizon of 10 years. If you read previous papers that uh, we have written, we have argued repeatedly in favor of a large public infra infra infrastructure investment plan. And we believe that uh, such a plan will, will be beneficial first because of its direct effects on aggregate demand, but also because of indirect effects on increasing productivity and uh, increasing the competitiveness of, of the U.S. economy. However, it seems now that the promise investment plan will be a plan of tax cuts for corporations that engage in infrastructure investment. And this kind of plan is clearly inferior compared to uh, a plan uh, of direct government expenditure. And why is that? Because a big portion of the tax cuts will be tied to public works, works that would materialize in any case. So both the direct and the indirect effect of such a tax cuts plan will be inferior in terms of promoting growth and employment. And also given the desired fiscal neutrality of, of the government, such a plan would also have negative side effects on income inequality. It, it's also not clear what proportion of, of this plan would make up, made up of projects to increase border security which uh, I think we can agree that they will not have a very positive effect on, on productivity growth. Uh, but in any case, for the moment, the only concrete infrastructure-related measure that has been proposed by the new administration is the reduction of the Department of Transportation spending by 13%. So this is the only thing that we have seen so far, which obviously will have will have very negative effects on uh, infrastructure spending. The last trademark promise of, of the new administration is an aggressive trade policy to reduce trade deficit. We believe that, in theory at least, such a policy could have some effect on reducing the trade deficit in the United States. There are two problems with that. The first one is that it's very unlikely that the U.S. trading partners will not react to aggressive policy measures. So it's almost sure that if the U.S. unilaterally imposes tariffs or border adjustment taxes and so on, the U.S. trading partners will respond with their own tariffs and their own taxes. So the effect will be lower than what one would expect uh, uh, on a ceteris paribus assumption. The second reason why one should be skeptical about the effective effectiveness on, of these measures is that the underlying analysis is based on a kind of a Ricardian view of trade, where we have one good produced, uh, we have wine produced in Portugal, we have cloth produced in England. Well, if England imposes tariffs on Portuguese uh, imports, these imports are going to decrease. The problem, and again, Michael showed a graph, uh, is that nowadays trade takes place along integrated value chains. So one good is produced in one country, is then exported to another country where it's used as an intermediate good in the production of a, another good, which is then exported to a third country or back to, to the first country. And if one looks at the data, a big portion of U.S. imports from Mexico and China is made up of this kind of intermediate capital goods. So in this case, the imposition of tariffs or uh, border, border adjustment taxes has uncertain effects. And clearly the effects are going to be lower than one would expect if we, we were living in a, in a Ricardian world. The last thing why we are skeptical about the effectiveness of, 
the proposals of the new administration is that it is unlikely that they will manage to go through Congress. And it, will, it is unlikely that they will accommodate the, conflict, the conflicting interests of the two principal factions within the Republican majority. And I guess the case of the health care bill uh, is telling. On the one hand, there was the conservative wing of the Republican Party that was finding that this new bill was too, uh, uh, was not uh, conservative enough. And then there was the more centrist wing of the party that uh, was finding that uh, um, uh, the new bill was, uh, was too strict. So someone can imagine similar problems with most of the new administration's proposed measures. So to, to sum up, it's hard to see how the proposals, the policy proposals of the new administration will do something to significantly change the course of the US economy. If anything, because of the very negative impact of these proposals on income inequality, the situation is going to get worse. But in any case, the, the financial markets uh, five minutes, have reacted very favorably, and uh, the stock market has increased 12% in only four months. Uh, the new president recently boasted that the stock market had gained 3.2 trillion since his election. And this last run, this run, this run that started in November, started from an already elevated level in the stock market. So as of April, as of yesterday, the S&P 500 in index stood at uh, 2,350 points, and this is a 350% inflation compared to its draft in March of 2009. Over the same period, output prices, output inflation has been only 13%. So asset inflation since November is more or less the same as the output inflation since the March of 2009. If Hyman if Miski was here, he would tell us that you know, the, two pri this, the asset prices and the output prices cannot diverge forever. Uh, looking at the stock market from another point of view, here are two graphs uh, uh, of, the, of the ratio of the market capitalization to gross domestic income and the net operating surplus. Uh, looking at the market cap capitalization like this, we see that it is now at a higher level compared both to uh, the late 90s and 2007. Or if we normalize the, uh, the market prices to, to the earnings of the firms, we see, oops, we see here that this uh, Schiller P ratio is now close to 30. The only periods in the past that the Schiller P ratio was that high was in the late summer and the early fall of 1929 and the last couple of years of the 90s. And also the home prices have, have increased. So we see here 2016 was important in that sense because the, the index of the home prices uh, caught up with it, its pre-crisis level. So now based on this uh, case uh, Schiller index, the house prices are higher than <coughs> they were before the crisis. So if we believe that there was there were asset bubbles in 2007 and in 2000. It's hard to see why they're not, why these price levels are, are normal. So to, to evaluate what might happen to the US economy, uh, we, we simulate another scenario where the stock market falls in the second half of 2017 and the first half of 2018 and then stabilizes for the rest of the projection period. We simulate a fall of the S&P 500 index to around 1600, which is still above its pre-crisis level in 2000 and 2007. And the fall in the stock market induces a second round of deleveraging, which lasts from the end of 2017 to the end of the projection period. 
in our simulations, this has a very negative impact, as one would expect, on the growth rate, which drops to minus 2% by 2019 and 2020. So just to sum up, I st the, the title of my presentation is, is this time different than the answer is that unfortunately this time is not different. Uh, as I explained, achieving sustainable growth in the United States requires addressing its three fundamental problems, a decrease in income inequality and improvement in the U.S. external position and a relaxation of the government's fiscal stance. But if one examines the, the conditions of the new administration and its policy proposals, one can conclude that it is unlikely that the new administration will be able to solve any of these problems. If anything, things will get worse. And finally, as I explained uh, in my last few slides, asset markets pose a threat uh, for the economy and the reverse are, could be triggered by other reasons which I don't have the time to discuss right now, so I will leave it to, for the Q&A part of the session. Thank you. Thank you to the presenters. Uh, before we open up to audience questions, uh, I have a few questions I'd like to ask myself. And so, first question I'd like to begin with, and this goes to everyone in the panel. Uh, coming up on the first 100 days of the Trump administration, and uh, perhaps the signature uh, thing that's happened to Donald Trump so far is one of the things he said he was going to do first uh, was pass an overhaul of the health care system, and that has not happened. Um, his Treasury Secretary has talked about pushing back tax reform, and I guess partially related to this. So do you have any sense now, uh, you know, with, with about three months on the clock for his administration, do you know, do you have any better sense of what kind of president he's going to be for the economy in terms of uh, will he be effective at creating policy? Do you have any sense of his what his actual governing ideology will be now that he actually has, uh, you know, the power of the presidency. So I'll offer it up to each member of the panel to take a crack at it. Uh, maybe I'll, is this on? Uh, maybe I'll go first because I probably have the least to say uh, on this. Um, but uh, we have a few months to, to answer that. Uh, we would say a couple of things. First, from our point of view, with the focus on um, the business cycle, the economic cycle, uh, very often, uh, especially in the near term, uh, the administration is along for the ride uh, as opposed to uh, driving uh, too much of it. And uh, therefore, um, it's hard to attribute a, a lot. I mean, I think there was some confidence in market moves, but that's not really the, the underlying economy itself. Um, and then I would turn to the, what we always look at, which is the leading indicators. Uh, and what have they done? Uh, and I showed um, for the U.S. Uh, the long leading index, which ticked down for what it's worth, uh, and the future inflation gauge, which has uh, plateaued. Uh, so the indications there uh, may be one of a little moderation, I guess, uh, on the margin. Uh, but that's about as much as we could read into it. I guess I just echo the remark that generally I think most macroeconomists caution people not to ascribe too much power of the president to affect the business cycle. Um, obviously, though, if the president does bad, I think it's easier for, <laughs> for the president to do bad things to the business cycle than to do good things. So, and I mentioned trade as one of those. Um, and I think that's particularly true when you're at a point of full employment, right? So, <clears throat> two, three, four years ago, or maybe four, five, six years ago, I think most macroeconomists were saying probably a little more fiscal stimulus would work. I think right now you probably want to have a pretty neutral fiscal posture. posture. And, you know, because you're at full employment, we think the Fed should probably do the fine tuning at this point in the business cycle. Um, so, you know, so far we don't think the president, again, echoing the other remark, is, is having that huge an impact on first quarter or second quarter growth and probably not a, even on the second half growth. Um, and we're just crossing our fingers that, you know, some of the more out of the 
<laughs> out of mainstream policies that are, were advocated in the campaign are the way to go. Uh, I think that fiscal policy would work right now, but uh, I don't think it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, Trump is kind of trapped in the contradictory statements that he has made uh, before the elections and after the elections, so it's really hard to see how this the promises would uh, would go through Congress. And I think he he's beginning to realize that these uh, changes are not so easily to be implemented. I mean, he he recently admitted that I didn't I could not imagine that uh, healthcare reform would be so <laughs> complicated or that tax reform would be so complicated. And I think it's the same thing when it comes to trade policy. He has a very simplistic uh, view of, uh, of trade agreements that I will just, you know, increase a little bit the tariff and everything is, uh, will magically you know, uh, be, be better, but this is not going to happen. Do you get any sense that the protectionist trade rhetoric that he used on the campaign was just that, just rhetoric, and that actually as he governs that, you know, we, we already see the border wall uh, fading off into the distance, and that was literally one of his most important things he campaigned on, do you, do you have less worry now that he's actually going to be a, a truly protectionist pres president with all the risks that could come to the economy from pursuing that sort of, uh, you know, agenda? Um, yeah, I think generally, yes. Uh, obviously, the, the, the things that can be done uh, just by executive order are up for grabs, and you've mm -hmm. seen more activity there. Uh, which may relate a bit more to regulations uh, as opposed to um, new, uh, newer, grander policies, including uh, fiscal and budget items that are going to, as, as uh, was just discussed, are going to run into the realities of Congress. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, hard to know at this point, but I think what we've heard makes us a little less worried than we were in, in January. <laughs> you know, I, I think some of the appointments, some of the Reagan era trade negotiators suggest, you know, it's going to be a tougher line taken on trade, but it's not going to be sort of some of the across the board uh, uh, tariffs that were contemplated. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, the meeting with the Chinese uh, Premier showed that the tone has changed a lot in mm -hmm. the last few weeks. Um, I was taken by your chart about uh, that. 2,000 year history of economic uh, uh, activity and where dominance, um, uh, where actually I mean, historical dominance has been in uh, China and India. And, uh, you know, we talk a lot about demographic challenges for the U.S. economy and for Western Europe. Um, and as I understand it, that's also an issue for China as well, too, as a result of its, uh, you know, the one child policy. And Generally speaking, uh, you know, if we're in a world where interest, you know, the Fed's not likely to raise rates as much as it you know, historically did, if our star, uh, the natural rate of interest is lower than it was, do you think there's an underappreciation or people aren't paying enough attention to these long-term demographic challenges faced in, you know, some of the world's most you know, important economies, you know, as, as a long-run issue, you know, as, as people talk about policies that could, uh, you know, lead to high levels of growth, all, all sorts of different things. Are these demographic challenges being um, under underestimated? Um, uh, less so. I, I think the answer was uh, very clearly yes uh, several years ago. Um, and uh, we talked about that at previous conferences. But I think nowadays uh, there's a lot more <laughs> appreciation uh, for um, uh, the demographics and the productivity growth challenges. Um, if you, I, I don't know the exact comparison, but take a look at India. Uh, India is uh, um, got a lot of potential for productivity growth and some pretty good demographics. And um, the market seems to be uh, voting that way, uh, even though there were some pretty radical things done with policy, for example, not too long ago with, uh, with uh, some of the, yeah, the, the demonetization and all these things. <laughs> and um, still, the secular outlook there and in some other markets um, look 
quite a bit more attractive. And the comment I made of, about um, Germany's demographics speak to that to a degree. Um, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a big geopolitical minefield about what's going on with uh, immigration. Um, but the reality is, you know, uh, growth is how much is your labor force growing and how much more can you, each person who's working, put out, put out per hour. And you can't get away from that. So um, when we look at the policy prescriptions, you know, at the end of the day, how do they trickle down to those items? Are they going to help or hurt those items? So um, an infrastructure proposal is potentially uh, very interesting, uh, but it needs to have some sort of line going to productivity growth uh, per hour, output per hour. Uh, otherwise, uh, you may be building a bridge to nowhere, uh, and that's been tried too, and that has a short-term effect, mm -hmm. but not a long-term effect. When, you, when you're talking about global trade, I mean, if you think about it, uh, just for a second, it's still one of my favorite statistics, even though it's getting old, uh, is uh, China's reaction to the financial crisis and with all the building that they did. In, uh, I think it's like 11 to 13, um, they poured more concrete than the U.S. did in the 20th century. <laughs> so they built a lot of things, um, but just what exactly is that doing for productivity or capacity or you know, the potential for us to invest in other areas of the world, um, it has an impact, an unintended consequence. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that it's interesting to think if this uh, slowdown in productivity is, uh, is an exogenous or, or not. Mm -hmm. So implicitly, Robert Gordon or uh, this approach to, to productivity slowdown is that we have an exogenous decrease in productivity that kind of uh, limits the, the growth potential of the economy. But there are also other explanations. I mean, the slowdown in productivity in the United States took place, it has taken place in the last 10, 15 years. So it's probably a cyclical and it's probably related to slower growth in demand. Mm -hmm. The another <laughs> explanation of the slowdown in productivity could also be the slowdown in, in real wages. I mean, traditionally, the firms trying to uh, increase productivity to save uh, labor. Since labor is so cheap, then they, they don't really have the incentive mm -hmm. to, to innovate as much as they had in, uh, in the past. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sure to what extent, you know, Robert Gordon is right that you know we have this exogenous uh, sudden drop in productivity after 150 years of growth uh, in the United well, States. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. But I mean, if, if we, if we were, were, I think if we were looking at the data in the, uh, let's say mid 30s, we would observe a similar slowdown in productivity. I think Gordon has showed that in every decade since the 40s, you've had declining productivity, with the one exception of the 90s, and then you just return to the trend in 2000 and 2000. And And so I think the key there is, was that 90s, because that was the one little blip you had out, what do we know about that, and is that going to persist? And I think we know a good deal about the 90s just from a lot of cross-sectional evidence on both from firms and industries on the, uh, the intensity with which they used IT. That, that seems to be a pretty important thing. Right. So, yeah, so capital in investment in particular, <coughs> I mean, you were drilling down a little bit mm -hmm. into it. Um, I had a statistic, because uh, we've talked about this last year. So capital intensity, which is the ratio of capital to hours worked, it's a key component of productivity growth, um, has been negative since, I think, 2010. Uh, so that's unusual. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Uh, and yeah, people are, it's cheaper to hire a person if you have some demand. and. There's a uh, hesitation maybe to invest a lot, and perhaps the IT is a, is a piece of this. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure it is, but there's a hesitancy when there's so much capacity. Uh, the capacity isn't heavily constrained at the moment, given the fairly low demand. Right, so that's right. exactly the point, yeah. that it's probably 
low demand that causes this flow down in productivity and in capacity building and yeah. increase in oh. the output capital ratio and the low wage rate. Which comes first? Uh, <laughs> we get in the, go to the circle. Yeah. Well, let's uh, open it up to audience questions. Um, would you like to go? Um, given that there's a consensus among you that the Trump effect is a nominal effect and not a real effect, that he's not going to implement the policies he said, and he was elected as the hero uh, of a declining middle class, what what are your projections for American society four years from now? He will fail. Do we have a radical third party along European lines um, putting up a candidate? I mean, I'm just an economist, not a political <laughs> 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 uh, You know, I would say that there is a cyclical element to income inequality. There's obviously a huge and much huger secular element, but there is a cyclical element. And I think at full employment, you tend to see more of the wage growth in the lower and middle income. So I think there is some prospect to the extent we can stay at full employment and not overheat, but not slip back, that you could see a little bit of compression uh, in wages. Not that that's going get, to get you back to the 60s or 50s type levels, but I think you, there is some scope for some short-run improvement. How that plays out politically is not my expertise. I I think it was Michael Frohley's slide that talked about the declining rate of investment in IT. And I find this so startling because it seems like we're on the cusp of some sort of threshold of innovation in information technology with cloud computing and big data and automated cars and, and sensors and everything, you know, like uh, high uh, smart manufacturing. I find it so hard to believe that this isn't at some point going to affect productivity growth, or is it some problem in the measure that it doesn't show up already? Right. So um, I guess this kind of goes back to Yogi Berra's forecasting is typical, especially about the future. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and it's, I think it's particularly difficult about future innovation. So there is a lot of talk, as you say, about some pretty exciting things with autonomous uh, vehicles and so forth. So far, that hasn't showed up in the data. Now, there is a question about the data quality. I, in my reading of the evidence, it has been, are we mismeasuring GDP? Definitely. The question is, has that mismeasurement, mismeasurement gotten worse recently? I think there, there's less evidence. So we're definitely undercounting certain things, both in the overall economy, in hard to measure services, in IT. Uh, but I, don't, I haven't seen much evidence that that mismeasurement has gotten worse over the past five or 10 years in a way that can explain the unique features of the last five or 10 years. Now, that's not to say that some of the things you're talking about will pan out in a way that are going to spur greater capital investment in some of those technologies. Uh, thus far, it's been more anticipation or speculation or hope than actual outcomes. Gentleman right here, please. Thank you, Paolo Savona. I agree with uh, uh, Nikki Foros uh, that one of the crucial points for the future is the standard and poor behavior, which is at present, according to the traditional formulas, consistent with the level of interest rates also expect, expected to percent plus 1.5 of uh, uh, risks. Uh, so um, it's important not only for the mm, US economy, but also for the world stability. The rest of the world is looking the, to the behavior of uh, standard poor. Mm -hmm. So you had a, a, a negative judgment on this point because you said that uh, perhaps the price earning is not consistent and will become more consistent if the fiscal policy of the Trump administration is in favor of increasing the denominator. I mean the, 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 the um, yield of the shares. Right. Yeah, the, the valuation of the market mm -hmm. right now is based on uh, yes, some expecting uh, earnings, which like a huge increase in the 
in the earnings, which it doesn't seem that it's going to happen. Are you asking me? I mean, the <laughs> well, the the formulas I'm I'm using are the these conventional measures of the yes, price the to the earning ratio. Are the earnings from the bank. I'm certainly not forecasting the stock market, no, no. so I, uh, that's, I'm definitely not doing that. Uh, uh, but uh, no, not for the customers. It's richly valued, I think, is, the, is one of the points made. Um, I mean, if, if things become normalized and nothing goes wrong and we just keep going, maybe it'll all work out. But there's a, there's a great deal of, deal of uh, ifs, a few ifs in there and some hope. Uh, and. We'll see. I, I don't think. I think we're pointing out, certainly beyond the next couple of quarters, that there are some real issues. I think all of us have, in one way or another, said that today. Um, which uh, maybe we have a tiny bit of breathing room to start to address, and maybe we'll do it, and maybe we won't. Um, I think we were saying. You, you and I were both saying, in a way. Uh, uh, for just short, shorter term, for the next few quarters, you know, or you know, the foreseeable future, things are looking a bit better. And you know, it's been a long time since outside the U.S. hasn't been a bit of a drag. And so, you know, we have a moment here. Uh, you know, Mike. Uh, earlier, we were talking about Stan Fisher's speech last night, where he uh, mentioned how uh, Hyun Song Shin has been saying. You know, you can't ask the market what it thinks. So to try and get what the market's saying, you can have hundreds of different narratives. And some of them may be related to anticipation of fiscal action. But I've heard certain operators who say, well, Q4, Q1 earnings are looking really good. You know, they don't really care about the fiscal. So what is it? Uh, I think it's hard to say. If it's expectations of fiscal, or if it's deregulation, or if it's earnings, or if it's foreign growth, I think these all kind of point in a similar direction, but trying to disentangle it is really tough, which I think was part of his speech last night. Uh, the gentleman in the green shirt, please. Well, with, uh, with, with the uh, concept of you know, the three inequalities and so on, today we're about to get a, an, exec an executive order that says buy American, hire American. How is that going to fit into the longer-term thought process? Is that going to be kind of an immediate thing? 
would impact into the longer term projections that you have? Or how, how are we going to look at that as a society? Um, I'll take it first because it's fair for the, let's say the structural part, the middle part of the presentation, which was productivity growth and demographics. Any policy by America, mm -hmm. higher America, the real question at the end of the day, beyond, beyond the, the other related issues with respect to structural growth is, does that shift in any way demographic growth, the labor force growth, or does that shift productivity growth output <coughs> per hour? And I'm not clear on how that would do that. And, you know, the, when you make, when you're dealing with policy, which is a tricky thing, there's also all these unintended consequences that you, you might be on, at least on some level, okay, this seems pretty straightforward, but what are the unintended consequences? And uh, you were talking about all, you know, the supply chains and all of the way these things, you know, the intermediate goods, all these different things that are happening uh, that could get really mucked up very fast. Yeah. Yeah, just the only thing I'd add is there's some uncertainty as to how that would also fit in with certain bilateral and multilateral trade agreements that are already existing. I'm not a trade legal expert, but I know those concerns are out there, so I think that's just one more mm -hmm. consideration. I agree. Cool. Yeah, for for Michael Ferroli, if we got the assumed collapse in the market, about a thirty percent is correction in the market for whatever reason. What would you say is the most likely impact on the economy in terms of wealth effect and whatever else? How much could it affect growth? And then, of more interest, what, what is sort of the maximum likely effect you can imagine that you or the consensus might say would happen as a result of that? In other words, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm looking for sort of two different numbers. Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I think. In terms of wealth effects, we used to think prior to the crisis, every dollar of added wealth would raise the level of consumption by about three and a half cents. Uh, the experience since the crisis has been more like half that magnitude. And there's a bunch of reasons why that may be so. Some people talk about inequality, some talk about reduced ability to access housing wealth through HELOCs and so forth. Um, there are, like I said, a number of expl another, another one is just that people are treating wealth gains more cautiously given, you know, fool me you know, twice, shame on me kind of attitude. Um, so I think that could kind of bound, I think the estimates on the wealth effect is between 1.7 to 3.5% of the lost wealth in reducing the level of consumption. What that would do then for um, business investment, I think, one, you have just reduced demand there is, as you know, there's a lot of economists in the audience, the Q theory of investment. Um, I think, I, my previous life, I was the, the CapEx guy at the Federal Reserve Board, so I have some experience with that. The Q model as an empirical forecasting model doesn't hold up as well as things like accelerator models. So I wouldn't think that necessarily would have a huge um, hit to CapEx beyond what it does to uh, final demand. Um, uh, and lastly, I just point out, uh, so you say, I think it's kind of difficult when you say this exogenous hit to wealth. I would kind of like to know <laughs> what's happening there. Uh, but whatever is driving it, one can assume that uh, the Fed is going to not be raising rates. They're going to be cutting rates back to zero and probably expanding the balance sheet once again. So that could have some offsetting effect in terms of both asset values as well as the impact on the economy. So that sounds like maybe only so I'd have to go, uh, let me, let's take a look. I would need uh, a little more time to run the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. I have a question for Mr. Morelli. You didn't want to talk about that latest uh, inflation number. <laughs> no, uh, I did, but I didn't but want to get into the details too much to pour the crowd. Just, uh, <laughs> maybe just some of the detail. But did you see anything in the details that would make you think this was either an aberration or that it, there's something in there that will make you believe that core PC will pick up again t t towards 2% by the end of this year. Sure. And if not, uh, how does that look? Uh, June or July hike, yeah. how does that make it look? 
So I think the biggest aberration, one that everyone saw, was that uh, prices for cell phone services declined 7%. Uh, apparently, this is only for new contracts. So if your contract didn't go down, you weren't being mismeasured. This is how they, they do it. Um, even if you strip that out, because it's a pretty small component, core CPI increased only 0.04%, which would still be a huge miss relative to what consensus was looking for. Um, so we should expect that to reverse next month. But even with that reversal, there were other parts that were still weak. So core goods was surprisingly weak. Generally, we think when the dollar is depreciating, import prices go up and goods prices go up. That hasn't happened in spite of three months of dollar weakness. And then probably what was, you know, there's a category there that basically measures rents, imputed rents for people who own their own homes. It's called owner's equivalent rent. That's been slowing a lot over the past three or four months and continue to do that last month. Why that matters is that doesn't jump around a lot. There's a lot of serial persistence. So if that's weakening, uh, that had been kind of a bulwark lifting up overall core inflation. If that's going to be on a softer trend, uh, it, it, will, it could slow down the path toward, uh, toward 2%. We generally think that you know, with labor costs rising, there's gradual upward pressure. Uh, we certainly see that unit labor costs, which are adjusted for productivity, have been putting downward pressure on margins. Corporate profit margins are still high but they've been coming down. They peaked about two, two or three years ago, so they've been coming down because of rising labor costs. The question I think a lot of people have is, how much does that get absorbed in lower profit margins and how much gets passed on to higher prices? So far, the bulk of it has been uh, squeezed profit margins, but at some point, firms are gonna try and push that on. Uh, so we think the path to 2% still looks attainable by year end. Um, and we think with an unemployment rate of 4.5%, the Fed is still inclined to go in June. As much as they talk about, uh, you know, flatter Phillips curves and all that, I think at their heart of hearts, that is how they forecast inflation. Um, so I think they probably feel like, all right, we get a little breathing room because of this. Still going to go in June, I, I believe. Um, but it, perhaps at a less hurried, you know, tempo, or risk of a less hurried tempo. Anyone else have a question? Uh, back there. Hi. Uh, there's a uh, bit of an inconsistency in different stories that you hear reported, not in anything that anybody's been saying here, but um, an inconsistency in terms of uh, demand for labor and supply of labor and productivity. Uh, on the one hand, you hear anecdotal stories about how hard it is to find cra tradespeople, craftspeople, plumbers, electricians, and so forth. Um, at the same time, you hear that the new jobs are all in high tech, that, that you need a lot of new high tech people on the one hand. On the other hand, you see things like productivity down where, uh, where it is, you know, down at the very low level. Uh, you see that it's now cheaper to hire people than it is to invest in capital products. Uh, it seems that one of the things that's missing in all this analysis is, a, is an overall analysis of the composition of the workforce. Who's measuring, are there any measures of the composition of the workforce? So for example, uh, in the household survey of BLS, it says that there are about four million people working in computer and math related fields. Four million out of 140, 150 million people in the whole workforce. If the demand for work is in that area where there's four million, how much demand is there that's going to bring up the overall production, that's going to bring back higher salaries, greater productivity? At the other end of the spectrum, where you do see growth, is you see growth in food services, hospitality, and food services particularly, and temporary workers. If you look at it over the overall composition of the workforce, you see these low-tech, low-wage, low low-interest kinds of jobs are the places where you see the growth occurring in the actual statistics. So is there anybody that's looking at the composition of the, of the labor force on those terms? Where are the jobs numerically really increasing? What has changed over the last 30, 40, 50 years in terms of the composition of the workforce? Has anybody looked at that? Yeah. Thank you. I mean, well, I mean, there are several different ways you can slice and dice. As you mentioned, the household survey uh, has occupation. Uh, the, and they also have by, uh, by education level. 
Uh, and then if, as you turn to the establishment survey, you have it by production workers uh, and non-supervisory workers versus supervisory and non-production workers. And then industry, which kind of gives you a little bit of a, a, a better sense. And then you, of course, have um, today, just today, actually, the, the Usual median weekly earnings, which is a quarterly survey, has a little more detail there, and then you have the annual occupational service. When we kind of go through all of these, we don't think the job growth in recent years has been all that low quality uh, in terms of either the um, skill mix that's measured by education, uh, traditional supervisory versus non-supervisory. Uh, a variety of measures suggest that to us it doesn't look particularly low quality. Um, it tends to be the case that usually in recoveries, uh, at least in the early years, job growth, but not levels, is low quality because you tend to lay off those people first, right? So you're hiring them back. And so some of the job growth, at least in the first few years, uh, did look lo lower skilled or, or however you want to uh, phrase it. Um, and in terms of the wage growth, uh, we don't think there's a huge mystery there. It's, you know, we only got to around 5% unemployment last year. And, but there are some lags here in terms of tighter labor markets to wage growth. And those lags, we think, probably are a little longer in part because uh, there's just less churn in the economy now. So fewer people quitting jobs, uh, fewer, you know, for the same amount of net hiring, there's less gross hiring and gross separations. And that may slow down the process a little bit because a lot of the aggregate wage gains come when people do job-to-job -job switches. And there's less job-to-job -job transition, so that may we think, speculate, has led, led to uh, tighter labor markets having a slower kind of transition into higher wages. Um, but we think the quality has not been particularly bad lately. In our uh, we've, uh, we've got time for like one or two more questions. Had anyone like that? One slide that I didn't see up there was uh, credit creation. Um, could you guys comment about uh, where I catch actually the most recent, uh, I guess, news, I guess, was uh, CNI loan growth from large banks has kind of started to roll over since January. And uh, just where are we in the long term kind of credit trend? Um, I'll make a quick comment on, on that loan growth in particular is a bit um, more, I mean, it's related probably to what happened with the decline in energy prices, but. It's also traditionally a bit more of a lagging indicator, uh, in particular, CNI. You know? um, so we did have a slowdown in the economy um, from uh, 15 into the end of 16, you know, the middle of 16. So um, it's reasonably consistent with that. Um, I think, you know, going forward, you want to watch what's going on with consumption. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would totally echo that on, on the CNI. It does seem to lag. Um, and it probably reflects that levels, we think, that levels of CapEx, even though they're picking up in Q1, are still low, whereas levels of internal funds have gotten a nice boost over the past two years, uh, I'm sorry, two quarters, because of better profit outcomes. So, um, so we think it's lagging that probably we start to see CNI pick up again after, I don't know if it's a few months or a few quarters, but, uh, you know, we, we would be more concerned if, if the data we were seeing um, was pointing to capital spending slowing. But as I said, the most recent data seems to show a bit of a pickup in Q1. Uh, so final question. I thought I saw a hand back there. It, it strikes me, this has been a wonderful panel, but it strikes me it, it could have been titled uh, Four Decades of Voodoo Economics uh, <laughs> and the consequences thereof. Uh, some of the things that jumped off the graphs for me were, uh, I, think, I think it's true that, it, that this last recovery is unique in uh, the decline in government spending, the decline in fixed investment, or at least the relatively slow growth of fixed investment. And we're, we're, the banality of the public discussion of, of policy with with voodoo economics on, on one side and, and stronger together identity economics on the other side without any attempt to think about the connection between uh, economic growth and the investment that 
fosters productivity is just just continues to dismay me and I I guess I'm making that comment to ask do you see anything turning around in the quality of the public discussion uh, no <laughs> I, I, I mean I'm, I'm sorry but uh, I wish I agree with you um, but I don't I actually this kind of conference is you know, somewhat unique in that sense. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have anything to push back on what you said. No, I, yeah. <laughs> I wish I, I had a more optimistic final answer. <laughs> I think there is some improvement. I mean, nobody would talk about inequality 15 years ago. Now even the president of the Fed is talking about uh, mm. inequality. Or, uh, uh, I don't know, fiscal expansion would be a taboo for in Washington. Uh, now it's probably slowly getting in uh, a more favorable year. So I think there is a slow improvement. I don't know if it's going to be fast enough in the future to, to fix things. But this remains to be seen. Okay, well, I guess we're at time here. I want to thank the panelists who did a great job, and thanks for inviting me. And, uh, thanks.